Well, good day to you. It's Thanksgiving week, and we really do have a lot to be thankful for. I'm doing a series on God, the truth about God. And last week, we talked about God is real. Today, I want to talk about God is revealed and just begin talking about God is relational. So God is revealed. The truth is we really don't discover God. He is revealed to us. It says in uh, Columbus, I was thinking about the explorer, discovered America. Not really. There are already people here. It was already discovered. But he just happened to bump into it. He wasn't even intended to come to America. He was intending to go to India. And so kind of that's how it is with us trying to discover God. We, we bump into a lot of wrong things along the way. God is revealed. And the clearest way that God reveals himself is through his son. Hebrews 1 says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. The Bible says that Jesus came to give us understanding about God. 1 John 5, 20. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And the Bible says, that it takes Jesus revealing God to us. We could not know him otherwise without Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So read the Gospels. Read the Bible. It is the revealed word of God and reveals God to us. But I also want to talk about God is relational. Just beginning that topic. There are a lot of popular ideas about what God is like that really aren't true. So I want to give a myth and then the truth. The myth, one myth is God is distant. The truth is God is near. Deuteronomy 4.7 what other nation is so great as to have their gods near them, the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? Another myth says God watches us from afar, and that was made popular by a Bette Midler song. But the truth is God is involved in every detail of our life. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and your body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field? which are here today and tomorrow are thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Another myth is God is anxiously waiting to pounce on wrongdoers, when the truth is God is anxiously waiting to forgive all who ask him. Myth, God is either uninterested or unable to deal with the world's evil. Truth. God allows evil to continue so more people might be saved out of it. The truth is, God doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So in a world where people see God as unapproachable, the truth is, our God is relational. God's eminence means God is near. God's omnipresence means God is everywhere with you right now. 
God's omniscience, meaning God knows everything, every thought you're thinking. God's omnipotence means God is all powerful. He can help you in your time of need. So the number one way that we see God is relational and Jesus called, told us to call God Father. Our Father, Jesus said in heaven, hallowed be your name. So I'll continue this theme of God is relational next time. Let me turn it over to Kathy. I'm really thankful for solid words that we can enter into what is so stable about God. Um, it's been on my heart about uh, a life's work. And maybe when that comes to mind, someone could think what they spent their career on. But I think there's a, a word um, in the Greek that's called ergon, I think is how it's pronounced. And it actually comes down to what employs us, which certainly could be an employer, but what occupies us, what what occupies our hours and our days. And by this, we actually will give an account at the end. Um, this definition, to work, toil as an effort, or by which one is employed or how they are occupied, in act, deed, doing labor. So when James says that faith without works is dead, that it's these works that would complete our faith. Um, in Romans 2.8, Paul says those who seek honor, seek honor and immortality through continuing in well-doing, they will see eternal life. That well-doing, doing is that same word, ergon. Ephesians 2.10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has ordained that we should walk in before the foundation of the world. So as this theme for me personally, of the spirit bearing witness, there is something in that starts opening this up in Revelations 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead, those who die in the Lord from this moment on. So the spirit says, yes, like you are right. So they can rest from their hard work and their deeds shall follow them. So hard work here isn't just work as this ergon. It's actually means a cut, a cut that reduces one's strength. It causes labor, weariness, um, where somebody would actually feel troubled. And I guess my dear roommate in college just sent me this book that she published and she actually did this pottery. And she has a whole series that every pottery has a cut. Like what sort of ministry happens through a cut? And then as it goes on, the Holy Spirit says their deeds, and this is that word ergon, shall follow them. And follow, this is into eternity, to be this in the same with, to accompany, to be a disciple. Okay, so at this point, you know, you like myself could think, well, this is the under, what people are undergoing revelation. We are undergoing nothing like this. When you think of the, the, the cut, the weariness, um, beating the breast with grief, sorrow, intense labor, until, you know, we're reminded about Epaphras. So Paul was beaten, almost short of death, numerous times. But he could look at Epaphras and say in the act of prayer, this guy was doing hard work. He is, in, in, in Colossians 4, he is always struggling in prayer on your behalf so that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I can testify that he worked hard for you. So when he says about struggling in prayer, it's this word agonizomai. Okay, if, if we could just think of this in the context of entering into prayer, maybe prayer for someone we have prayed for for years and we don't see any budging. Like the, the aunt that Ed spoke of in the sermon, 
and that tries to push this kernel of corn on this ledge. We have prayed 69 times and that kernel has fallen back back on us. Okay, so I think we can relate to this ag agony in prayer. To compete for a prize, contend with an adversary, enter a contest, fight, labor fervently, strive. Can you picture yourself bringing this into prayer? For the errant child, the coworker, the neighbor, somebody that is in your life, and they are the good work prepared beforehand for you. They are the good work where you labor until you see them mature and fully assured in all the will of God. So who is going to come out of this contest on top? And so there's been times I've actually thought as I, I like I'm going like David into the valley with Goliath. And, and who's going to come out the victor? There's the familiarity I have with this person not changing week after week, month after month, year after year. There's my own doubt. But then, you know, Ed brought out something in the Sermon Sunday. And I think it's the end all question. Do you believe I can do this? He said to the two blind men. It had nothing about, are you good? Are you blind? Are you suffering? It's about, do you believe I can do this? And so, you know, just this whole study with the Trinity and where Jesus is right now. I mean, I just read this totally differently in John 14. Um, okay, so believing, okay, would be believing the name of Jesus. Because he goes to the Father, we will perform greater deeds. I will do whatever you ask in my name that the Father will be glorified in the Son. Now you realize that you know the pre-incarnation relationship of the Father Son is now knowing this <clears throat> different realm. And so our question when we're in the valley like David isn't, do I have enough faith? It is Jesus is with the Father. He wants to glorify the father. He wants the father glorified in him. They are in a stable place. Do we believe he can do it? I think we need to always come back there. And that I think is where the contest comes because we have our own weakness of the flesh. Again, the familiarity with a situation that doesn't change, but the, the real focus is can Jesus, who is now reunited with the father saying greater works for us, can he do this? Okay, so I think if we step back about what the Holy Spirit in Revelations 14 is saying, we would understand why there will be weeping and, and him wiping tears from our eyes. Because we are talking about those that have been placed before us as the work to pray for them standing fully assured and seeing that work follow us into eternity. I know as I was going over my prayer list one day last week, I mean, I kept coming to people on that prayer list that I I would just would weep to see them completed in this, this hard work of prayer. So Paul knew of himself as a priest to the Gentiles. If you read Romans 15, 16, and then Peter talks about us in 1 Peter 2, 5. We are living stones built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Revelation 1 speaks of we are a kingdom of priests unto our God. So what Paul realized as he, at the end of his labors, he was going to make, he was going to offer the Gentiles he had worked with as an offering to the Lord, an acceptable offering. So in the same way, we are priests too. And at the end of this age, there is an offering we are going to be giving before the Lord, praying it's an acceptable offering. So um, to read that exactly, let's see. I serve, this is Paul, I serve the gospel like a priest so that the Gentiles may become an acceptable offering. Okay, so as we appreciate that the Spirit was present 
before creation, at creation, at Jesus' baptism, at Jesus' death, at Jesus' resurrection. There was something following this from the same Holy Spirit that says, they shall rest from their hard work and their deeds will follow them. After Paul speaks about in Romans 15, 16, an acceptable offering, he adds sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So almost as if the offering wouldn't be enough, the Holy Spirit is going to make it holy. The same Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that's saying they will rest from their hard work. Their deeds will follow them. I hope, even if you can, in the context of these moments, that this will come together for you. The Spirit is really showing us the ultimate ending of this. And again, the Spirit that will end up making holy, sanctify, setting apart our offering is the same one who says, those works will actually follow us into eternity. So I, you know, and I think some things are unfolding right now, even in our nation. And maybe, you know, we're, we're just going to have to um, now accept as we go forward. So this, this message of hard work um, in the valley as David with Goliath and not budging from this contest of prayer is, is truly before us. But, and, and I, I think the other truth is it hasn't ended. We are now in the hard work. It hasn't ceased yet, but may we all realize that prayer can be hard work. The hard work that our, our brethren in Revelation were also um, experiencing. And this is a great thanks to us. Oh, Holy Spirit, thank you for dwelling in us and continuing to reveal the Son to us, the one who died for our sins, who revealed the Father that created us and gives us eternal life. We want to know you and give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a very good Thanksgiving. God bless.